The International Association for Near-Death Studies presents NDE Radio, a weekly exploration of near-death experiences and similar encounters with the other side. Now, here's your host, Lee Whitting. If you could talk to the souls of people who've passed over, what would you ask them about where they are? Do you think you know what they would say about what they do over there? And does what they do affect us? Welcome to NDE Radio, brought to you by IANS, the International Association for Near-Death Studies. I'm your host, Lee Whitting. Our guest today is Nancy Clark, Ph.D., who had a near-death experience when she was just a child. She also realized as a child that she had the ability to communicate with spirits, bringing messages to the living from those who have died. Today, Dr. Clark is a psychotherapist, author, international lecturer, and medical intuitive. Seminars on many subjects, as well as her 125-hour course and clinic in medical intuition and energy healing certification, have been taught around the world for over 20 years. Her latest book is The Energy Healer's Guide, an integrative medicine program for self-development and teaching. Dr. Clark is the coordinator of the international groups for IANS, and she's also the founder and director of AZ Integrative Studies, Integrative Therapies, rather, in Tucson, Arizona. Nancy, welcome to NDE Radio. Thank you, Lee. It's great to be talking to you and your audience today. Well, it's wonderful to talk uh, to talk with you. It's a little earlier out there in Tucson, I guess. It definitely is. <laughs> um, Nancy, I thought we might begin if you could tell us about your childhood NDE and um, the, the the abilities you discovered that you had when you were a child. Okay, well, let me begin by saying something that maybe other people haven't thought about. When a baby is born, they have to learn the skills of operating in a third dimension, which means they have to learn to see here. They they learn to hear in utero, so that mm. they are born with that skill pretty well developed. But things like, well, they're touching, they're walking, their third dimensional skills, speaking, all of those have to be developed. And by the time a child is six or seven years old, that is pretty much a part of their selves their developed selves, and they begin to forget the spirit that they were and their communications with spirit. But what happened to me at age six was I was struck by lightning, and at that point I really was able to maintain my connection with spirit. And it was something that served me very well all of my school days, as you might imagine, mm. because I, I had a little insight onto, well, even what my teachers expected of me. So I, I found life that way was, was quite fascinating. Do you remember... Um the experience, uh, what happened to you when you were struck by lightning? Oh, yes. Um, it was summertime. We had just moved into a new house that had windows in the living room that were only about a foot off the floor. It was a lovely summer day. It was raining and warm, and so the window was open. I had received an iron for doll clothes at Christmas time or my birthday. And mm. I was ironing a dress that for my doll that was soaking wet. And all of a sudden I saw this ball of lightning. And and what I have to say is seconds before any experience like this, whether it leads to death or near death, the soul is out of the body. So I was looking from above as I saw this bolt of lightning heading right through that open window 
into my chest. Wow. And it threw me quite a distance. It threw the iron and and blew out all the circuits in that side of the house, by the way. <laughs> and, and so my my father was very unhappy when he came home. It didn't realize how serious it had been with me, but my mother found me, you know, on the floor and didn't know how long I had been there. But the iron had burned a huge scorch mark in the new wood floor. Oh, dear. <laughs> so it was uh, perhaps watching that bolt of lightning going through the house and then going into an electrical outlet that was quite fascinating to me as I was out of the body. But then I was rejoined with my spirit guides that were going to be with me the rest of my life. And what I found Mm. interesting from that point on is some of them seem to be the same age as I was. So they matured with me. They appeared to. While others, others were in their adult form at all times. Did did you have to travel anywhere to meet them, or were they right there waiting for your spirit? To me, they are always right here with me. (laughs) So I I don't have to travel anywhere. (laughs) So they were up by by the ceiling? No. (laughs) No, I, I think that that is kind of a myth. We say that Babies in the crib, they always look up, so they always have a feeling that spirits are above them, because that is their visual vantage point. But as you learn to see spirits, they're not up there. They're, They're as close to you as any person would be who is talking to you, so... It, that's a different perspective that I, most people, we kind of believe what everyone tells us. Mm. So well, like they, some people say, you know, heaven is right here. It's not up there or way out there. It's right. <laughs> it's uh, like Jesus said, it's with, within us and uh, it's among us and within us as well. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Nancy, um, so did was it from that point on that you were able to communicate with spirits, or was it just uh, that you were able to continue communicating something that you'd had from from well, early childhood? That's a much better explanation. I simply continued, and and they are as much a part of me today as they were before. I I am in communication with spirit many many times a day. If I want to ask a question or if I want guidance on something or, you know, just just checking in. <laughs> now, do you differentiate between people who have passed over their oh, spirits yes. a, a, and spirits that are your guides, as it were? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. You know, just the other day I was walking through the house. And I heard, Nancy, and this long, drawn-out last syllable of my name. And my immediate thought was, I'd recognize that voice anywhere. And I thought, (laughs) oh, my goodness, that is my friend from high school and college who had just made her transition about a month before. Mm. And so I said, Marco, you're here. And she said, yes, I am. And so... We began that conversation. But yes, there there's a totally different vibration that you recognize that is the vibrational essence of the person when they were physical. And, and what, uh, speaking more generally, what have they told you or what have you learned about uh, life on the other side? Well, there are several stages that we go through once we pass to the other side, and and generally speaking, at initially, a person wants to make the rounds and be sure they say goodbye to everyone, and depending upon 
the need of the person left behind, that determines how long they will be hanging around immediately. But there comes a time when they have to go into (laughs) what I call R&R. They have to rejuvenate their body back to perfection. And the longer someone has had an illness, the longer it takes for them to realize that they can have a perfect body. They no longer have a limp or a a scoliosis of the spine or whatever it is. They learn that they can be perfected. And this is why when we see our loved ones in spirit, they always look much younger unless they are afraid you won't recognize them. And so they put on the appearance that you would remember. So, so it's, it's, go ahead. I'm sorry. So it's not an instantaneous thing when, when you cross over and your spirit is, uh, is out of your body, you might still manifest a limp or, um, or, um, scoliosis. It's very interesting that I had a friend with a withered hand from polio. Her arm and hand were quite withered. And so she had had it since she was a tiny girl, and she still didn't use that hand. And so it took a long, long time for her to be able to see it functioning normally. Although it looked fine, she still uh, protected it as though it were a problem. So it's more a psychosomatic uh a th- thing rather than an actual physical thing. That's it's right. The mem- it's the memory of the... Now, some people have theorized that uh, when we have an, an injury like that, that it it reflects some event that happened in a past life that was re- reappearing or was a, the result of some experience in a past life. Do you, Have you found that to be uh, true? Yes, I... I seldom find it, but I do find it at times, and it can even be generational, which <laughs> which makes it that much more difficult. Mm. But uh, there are patterns within groups. Um, for example, I would say, you know, the gypsies feel that they have been maligned and without a country for so long, and so when someone has been born and reborn into a gypsy situation, they tend to continue thinking that pattern of thought, if that makes sense to you. Mm. Yes, and so if they uh, reincarnate along with their uh, family members from a past life, they would probably be... Uh, continuing those same traditions in some way or another. Exactly, exactly. And yet there are people who, and this goes into the next phase of what we go through on the other side, those people who are really working on their spiritual path and trying to move toward enlightenment, they spend time doing, first of all, what they love to do, but also trying to evolve their souls so that when they come into another lifetime, wherever that may be, they will actually be more prepared for situations that were really difficult for them in past lives. Now, when you say they continue to do what they enjoy doing, for instance, if someone in, in their lifetime enjoyed walking in the woods or going to the seashore, do they come back to Earth to do that, or do they manifest this in their in their imaginations? Or um, well, how does that work? It's not their imagination, because 
when you are in this higher dimension, you are fully capable of creating any surrounding you want. And so I was watching an actual film, and it's too long a story to get into, but a man who had been a scientist in Switzerland, and he loved the mountains and he loved the seashore, so he had created mountains and his chalet that was right on the edge of this beautiful sea. So he had the best of all worlds. Mm. Let me now, just, go ahead. Go ahead. I <laughs> no, I was just going to say, did, did he create it in such a way that others could enjoy it, or was this simply something that was personal to him? It can be both. Others can enjoy it, or he could enjoy it in his solitude. But so th- this would imply that that uh, not only uh, God is a creator, but that we can manifest uh, to a certain degree creation from the other side as well. We can do it right here. It's just that we've forgotten. Yeah. <laughs> what anybody has to do is look at what's happening in their lives and realize that they are creating it right here and right now. It's a hard thing to imagine, but and it's not on a conscious level often. It can be at a soul level or a subconscious level, but they are creating. Wow. Now, sometimes people talk about souls being stuck in this earth plane. Do you think that it's a that it's a, that they're actually trapped, or are they just spending more time than than normal? Uh, before they leave to to go on? That's a great question. They are, I would say, trapped, but it's because of their own thoughts. They haven't realized, like perhaps a young person who has died very suddenly. I, I was stopped in traffic, although... The accident was on the other side of a meridian. There was a car stopped, and there was a young man standing there looking very puzzled because his car, his motorcycle was way underneath this SUV. And then I realized it was the spirit of this young man because he had already probably died when he went into this bad accident, and he was standing outside. So what happens is some spirits don't realize that they are only in spirit form, so they try to carry on as though they are still living here. And and often we hear of some a malevolent spirit. Well, most of the time they're not. They're just either trying to get attention or they're frustrated. Mm. Now, in your work, do you facilitate communication between uh, people and, and their lost loved ones? Very often. Um, if, it, if it comes up, then, then we can deal with that. And, and when that happens, Usually, the person is in the room, the spirit. <laughs> a woman, when I first started doing this work, she came in very unusually dressed in this gorgeous Kelly Green Chanel style suit. And, you know, it was, she was just way overdressed for an appointment. And she mm-hmm. sat down, and about that time I looked up, and here, the spirit walked in wearing the same suit. Ah. The only difference was the spirit was wearing a matching hat. And I said, is there a hat that goes to your outfit? And she looked at me really surprised. And she said, well, yes, how did you know? And I said, because your mother just walked in wearing the same thing. This was her suit, wasn't it? And she said, yes, that's why I'm here. Uh So it was a very interesting session. 
Now, when people, the, the traditional story about uh, the near-death experience and the tunnel and the light, when a soul travels into the light, are they still available to to you and to um, this earth plane? Yes. If, if they are not in this rest period, when they go through that rejuvenation period, they are really out of touch. And it depends how uh, much work their physical body needed to be repaired, how long that will be. You know, sometimes it's up to three months that they are away. I just lost my brother-in-law, and he will be in that period for at least three months. Now, when we think of time, for instance, three months, is it three months for us, but <laughs> not a uh, not a defined period for them. I mean, do they are they experiencing time over there? For for us, it seems like three months, but since there is no time on the other side, it may seem like a day. Or or I mean, you lose track of time when there isn't a sunrise and a sunset and and seasons unless you desire seasons, and then you create those. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I have been interrupting you all through this. Normally, I don't, I try not to talk so much, but this is such a fascinating uh, subject, and it raises so many questions. Um, Now, you were telling me the, uh, and have been telling me the the process that a soul goes through. Um, What happens after the R&R? Then, then they, as I mentioned, they start working with their soul's purpose to, to go forward. Uh, for example, I have a friend who died several months ago who was a well-known artist, and she was also a nun. So it was a very interesting um, idea to see the world not in a Catholic perspective. But as an artist, she was telling me one day how amazing it is that you don't sit down with a canvas and paint a landscape as you would do here. You go out into nature and you create the mountains and the trees and the flowers that you want in your landscape. <laughs> it's quite a bigger perspective, isn't it? Yes, instead of a representation, it's 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 the real thing. It is the real thing. So this, wow. this is what makes the learning during that stage so valuable because you are able to experience your version of reality on a whole different scale. You are able now, to experience creation. Do they uh, participate in what goes on on Earth? Do they try to direct or at least uh, help um, uh, maybe their family or even political situations, you know, where there's war or where there's poverty? Do the souls from the other side try to involve themselves in fixing those things? You know, I have never met anyone who was working on a big political agenda. They tend to be working at the, I, I would say, the, the basic levels. Now, a part of your question, we have like a grandmother in spirit or a parent in spirit who stays with that child until they are grown because they have made an obligation to do that. But there are other spirits that I know that really work with these new special children that are coming on Earth, trying to help them remember the the gifts that they have and 
how to stay in touch with one another to communicate more telepathically. Mm-hmm. And, and it's very interesting that the kids today sit and text one another, and two children can be sitting side by side, and rather than speaking, they are texting. Well, this seems like a terrible thing for, for a different generation. However, we are moving toward a higher level of communication where we will, as humans, be communicating telepathically with one another. And so the children are learning to do that through this texting. Do you think the increased incidence of autism is involved in that in any way? Well, unfortunately, it goes back to the inoculations they're getting. I just read a statistic yesterday saying by 2025 there will be one out of every two children will be autistic. If we continue with this program, however, these children can function on a different level. They, They just cannot learn in our traditional way. So as the frequency of Earth gets higher, they will be able to better communicate with themselves and the world as it is. Uh, Nancy, we're just about out of time, and we have so much more to cover. You'll have to come back, and we'll, we'll do another show together, if that's okay with you. That would be lovely. In the meantime, why don't you tell the audience how they can get your book and and a little about your classes that you teach? Okay. Um, My latest book is called The Energy Healer's Guide, and they can get it on Amazon. Uh, It's available in ebook form, too. I have another book called Earth in Ascension. I have three mini ebooks that will be coming out this year there, and they'll just, as I say, be in e-form. But if people want to contact me, they can go to my website, www.energyhealing.com, and I'm available for private appointments. I don't have any classes scheduled at this time of the year, but uh, there will be later and will you be at our IONS conference um, in uh, San Antonio? Oh, yes. I'm very much looking forward to it. <laughs> that should be fun. I've never yeah. been to San Antonio, so I'm looking forward to it from that point of view, too. It is an interesting city, yes. <laughs> um, let's see if there's any last question that I can squeeze in here. What do you suppose motivates people to reincarnate? Well, it's uh, <laughs> their soul's urging is absolutely the best way to say it because we grow so much faster spiritually when we are on this earth plane because earth is a school. And when we are on the other side with everything in harmony, we don't learn as quickly as when we are in this world of duality. Mm. So it, it's, the lessons are harder, tougher, but we learn faster. Interesting. Yes. Hey, Nancy, th- thank you so much for, uh, for being on NDE radio and, uh, thank you, uh, for, for descri- describing your, 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 uh, lightning strike. I, uh, <laughs> that must have been, uh, quite an experience. It was. And, uh, yes. If, uh, let me just tell my, the audience that if they'd like to listen again to, uh, to this show or to any of our past shows, uh, they can just go to our website at nderadio.org. And for more information about the work of IANS, check out their website, iands.org. And tune in next Monday, 11 a.m. Eastern for more NDE Radio. This is Lee Whitting saying thanks for listening.